<laughs> well, thank you for that. I don't know you, so I can't say I love you, but I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> it's uh, early in the morning. I so appreciate it. Um, I think we're just about to ready to start. Uh, but if I want to uh, wee wee in the middle, which I might, oh, gotcha. um, I would just go and wee wee and then we'd add that on to the, yes. to the time. I really hear you. I'm getting to that age where I never miss an opportunity to go wee wee. Well, you're very wise. Yes. <laughs> and I, yes. I have to... I have to drink because of my um, kidneys. They require it. So I'm told that medically I must drink. And if I drink, I have to pee. So that's what life's about at the moment. Where even are you and how's lockdown going for you? I'm in southwest London in Clapham in my study in a Victorian house built in 1856, I think. Um, I've lived here for 40 years. Is this the one that was the centre of a drug scandal or was that <laughs> your country house? No, that was my seaside place. That's no, where you were is, running This is definitely from. a no, no drugs area here. You, why are you in the UK? Uh, you're an Australian citizen. What happened? Actually, I think uh, coronavirus happened, and that's why I didn't spend more time in Australia this year. But I'm English too, and this is my main home, and my my life is here to some extent. So I'm lucky enough to be able to choose, and at the moment I'm choosing England I would like to go to Australia and I've got tickets to go in November, but I doubt that I'll be able to make it. It's not looking good, is it? Nope. You won't remember, but I met you one time um, backstage at Q&A in the green room and you were there with your partner who I believe likes to maintain her privacy, so I won't mention her name, but you two have been together since the 60s? Uh, we met in 68 and set up together immediately. And, How did you um, meet? My, my friend and her friend, Katerina Clark, daughter of the great Australian historian Manning Clark, introduced us because I, I was at school with, with Katie when her father came on sabbatical to Oxford, where I was born and brought up. And um, I'd become a lesbian in the years since we'd left school. And I told Katie and she said, oh, I know one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, she set up a meeting when they both came on a research visit to London. And I, the minute I saw uh, Heather, I knew that she was the one. She didn't. She just thought I was rather noisy. How did you know? I don't know. You just look at someone and you think, I like you. And then when, when I, you know, I fancy you. you, you look at them physically and your groin shifts a bit. And then you listen to what they have to say. And I liked her mind. And I still do. How old were you both then? I think I was 27. And had you had girlfriends before that? I think I picked up a couple of people, but I hadn't had a serious relationship. What was it like being a lesbian woman in the 60s? Well, I can only tell you what it was like for me. I don't know what it was like for everybody else. Um, it was considered rather embarrassing, I think, for most people. And people were fairly closeted. It was mm. not something that most people wanted revealed. There was a, a lesbian club in London called the Gateways in Chelsea, which I never went to. Um, and I've never really been interested in clubs. In fact, I run away from them. And I don't like uh, particularly being with groups of any any sort. I, you know, I don't rush to a lesbian meeting. And, um, <laughs> Do they have those? I, I, I rush away from them, quite honestly. Because <laughs> if you don't need to sleep with anybody, they're no different from anybody else. Were you ever closeted? No. I think I, that's not quite true. 
when I was in America making a career in, in films in Hollywood, my agent said, you know, please don't talk about being gay. But of course I did. Um, but it didn't, the sort of parts that I went in for didn't matter whether I was gay or not. And I don't think it's ever had an impact, quite honestly. I'm intrigued by the fact that you've been together for how many years? For 50 years? So yeah, I think it's 50, 52 years, I think. Have you ever lived together during that time? For short periods, yes, not for long periods. Holidays are always spent together. Um, but on the whole, no, we we have separate establishments in separate countries. How and does that work? Um, well, it just does. Because I'm busy and she's busy and we speak to each other at least once a day and we always have. I don't know. It's, you know, every relationship is very much dependent on the other person. It's the deal you make between you and that's the deal we've made and it works for us. I'm not saying it's going to work for everybody but it works for us. I've heard it said that... Um same-sex relationships are in many ways liberated from the sort of uh, checklist that straight relationships have, like you meet, you move in together, you get married, you have babies. Until quite recently you couldn't get married and even having babies was challenging in a same-sex relationship. Is that why you've never felt, well, we've been together this long, therefore we should hit this milestone and then this milestone is some kind of evidence that your relationship is getting stronger? <laughs> We don't need a, a milestone to show how how much we love each other. We have uh, performed a civil partnership in here in the UK, uh, which I imagine is um, valid in Australia. Um, but we did that not because we wanted to lay down any any uh, pre or post nuptial arrangements, but because if one of the partners is ill and goes to hospital, unless you're an official spouse, you are not entitled to any information about their illness or the prognosis or anything like that. And we we were older and we felt it was important that if one of us was ill, we were able to be treated as the spouse. So that's why we did that. I've heard you say that you haven't always been faithful in your relationship. That's true. Do you do you want more particulars about it? No, a I long don't mean time to cry. ago, I think it was probably in the eighties. I was, uh, I had an affair with someone. It was a disaster, and it uh, we separated. I think for six months, and I realised that I can't live without Heather. I don't want to live without her. And I'm not going to and didn't gamble with my happiness again. I think adultery is um, a silly, tiresome thing. And I'm sorry that it happened. I wished, I wished that I hadn't done it. Um, but I did, and I have to admit it. You say you don't like to hang around in groups, but one of the things that many people have struggled with um, with corona is isolation and being not even in the same country as Heather. How's that been for the two of you and for you and yourself? Oh, it's horrible. I hate isolation. I'm a social animal. Heather isn't. But um, I, I think it's been bloody awful. I can't stand it. I think everybody's going slightly off their heads, actually. Um nothing good about it at all. Isolation is something that you want to choose, not have it enforced upon you. And it's um, it's a miserable business. You're a, an award-winning actress. I am. <laughs> One of my awards is behind me, actually. Is that your BAFTA for the Age of Innocence? No, that's um, a microphone award for a a best uh, 
sound performance. Um, my BAFTA is there, but um, oh yes, you can see it. Yeah, it it's I can rather see it too. yeah. That's that's the that's my BAFTA. I know Emma Thompson, who's got several BAFTAs and Oscars as well. She puts them in the loo, but I don't have as many as she does, so I put mine on show. <laughs> Yes, it's it's almost a show offy thing to say, oh, I just put them in the bathroom. Well, she's got a lot, so yeah, and, she does. and so she should, but I didn't expect to get one and I'm very thrilled to, to this day that I did. What's I was gonna ask you, there are a lot of people who will know you best for your work in Harry Potter as Professor Sprout. You've you've been very honest about how you loved the opportunity of getting to do those those films, but it's not it wasn't perhaps the most challenging work of your career or the most meaningful. How do you reconcile what you're best known for, certainly to a whole generation, with perhaps not your favourite work that you've ever done? Well, I don't bother to reconcile it. It's just how it is. You know, I mean, um, it was a very successful series of films and I'm very proud to have been not an important character but a character in uh, an iconic series. I made some money out of it which was lovely and children and everybody recognizes me all over the world which is very flattering and nice. There isn't a thing against it. Uh, it wasn't one of my greatest performances it just happens to be the one that most people have seen and I'm very glad it's been seen I'm not I'm not in any sense bitter or twisted about it I it's a fact and when things are a fact you get on with it when we were organizing this interview there was all the back and forth about can you download this software and can you here's what we need to do and this program and you wrote the most fabulous email that I've wanted to write so many times in my life that basically said, this is all really hard. I can't do this. I'm quite crap at it. It's not fair that you're expecting me to be technical when I'm not. Harumph sort of thing. And I thought, <laughs> go sister. I have wanted to send that email so many times. Have you always been like that? Or do you think it just is a freedom that gets with, you know, you get with getting older? I truly think I've always been like that. Mm. I've always been somebody who I hope doesn't hurt people because hurting people is not a good thing. But I've always just said what I thought and and what I feel. And I feel very strongly that, um, I mean, one of the problems about being old today is that technology is increasing ever more into our lives. And if you're not computer literate, you can be excluded, you can be disenfranchised. And that's frightening. And I know a lot of too. my friends of, of, of my age who don't use Zoom or, or don't use WhatsApp and, and the other uh, connecting technologies because they don't know how to or they can't turn on their smart televisions. And it's shocking. We, we ought to be kinder and have technology that people who are not very good at it can work because otherwise we, we're cut out of modern life and it's wrong. I mean, what about all the people like me who are at home because we're vulnerable to the COVID virus more than most people because we're old and fat and we can't go to the shops? How do we arrange deliveries online? What happens if you don't know how to do it online? You starve? There should be young people who are assigned to old people who go in and help them. I think it, it, it's not beyond the, the wit of man to devise. If we can get to the bloody moon, we ought to be able to go round to Mrs. Robinson and help her order her groceries. Like sponsor a nana. Yeah. Sponsor a nana. Exactly. I, I always felt that if in old people's homes, there should be a, a school contingent from a nearby school who goes in and helps people. And if they can't manage it, that's understandable because we all go do lally at some point. And if we're do lally, we can't. But if we're not yet do lally, for God's sake, help us. How have you been getting your groceries? 
I I have a secretary and she has a, an account with Sainsbury's and they come and deliver. And my neighbours are very helpful too. Uh, and they go and because there's a wonderful ice cream shop round the corner. And I love ice cream. It's very bad for me, but I do love it. And so they pop round for me and get it because I won't go to shops. I'm too nervous. I'm very scared of this virus, not just because I would die if I got it, but the treatment is so horrible. You know, lying on your tummy, not able to speak or see or anything, that scares me. I really don't want to get it. And hasn't it made you think, I think we're all sort of questioning or looking at our mortality in a different way and and with this new global pandemic, did it not make you want to be close to Heather? Like thinking, if I'm going to die, if I'm going to go out, I want to spend all my last time, remaining time, whether it's years or months, maybe hopefully decades in your case, with the person I love. I'm not, I'm not, it sounds like a leading question, but I'm just interested in your thinking. No, of course, you're absolutely right. Of course, it's made both of us absolutely determined to live together now, whether we'll be able to do it after so many years, I don't know. But the the plan is that uh, she will come to London eventually. We had hoped to be able to do it in Australia. But the truth of the matter is that the house that we have, which we love, it's the most wonderful house. And by the way, it is rentable on Airbnb. Where is it? It's called Yarrower Hill and it's in Robertson in the Southern Highlands. But it is not suitable for two old ladies uh, who eventually won't be able to drive. Mm -hmm. It's too far. It's four miles from Robertson where all the shops and doctors and everything are, which is a gorgeous village. It's lovely. But I suppose if we had staff, we could live there. But I don't know that I want to have staff. You know, I I don't feel I'm the sort of person that has staff. Um, So I think that living in England, where there is, you know, National Health Service, if there is by the time Boris gets out of office, Mm. pray God he exits the the building very quickly. Um, It's problematic. Health is problematic when you're old. And you have to think about it. So that would that would probably mean she'll come to, to England. There are some questions that I want to ask you that, I mean, obviously, if they're too personal, ignore them. But I kind of feel, having watched your other interviews and listened to Are you to going you, to ask me my love technique? Because that is too personal. Oh, no. not what is, oh, Now I'm dying to ask you about your love technique. Is it specific to you? <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> I'll never know. Um, I was going to ask you actually about getting older and sexuality as you get older because there's this idea that once um, people get to a certain age, you're not sexual beings anymore and you're not interested in sex anymore. Is that true? Yes. In my case, it is. I'm not interested in my sex anymore. I'm interested in other people's, I suppose. I mean, I, when I say that, not not tremendously. I think it's it's uh, overrated. I, I find people who talk about sex all the time really boring. I remember the encounters that I've had in my life, and I relish them, and I'm I'm glad of them. And I was a very sexual, oversex being when I was young, but I'm not now, and I'm glad I'm not because I'm able to do a lot more things in life rather than think about it all the time, which is what I used to do. I remember when I, when I particularly remember when I was in rep in Leicester in 1966, which was the year England won the World Cup. And uh, I went to synagogue there and I thought, I thought about sex the entire time <laughs> I was in the synagogue, which is shocking. You're meant to go and pray and think about God and sins and all that. Mm. Not me. When you see attractive women, do you still think, oh? No, I don't I don't um, think of them in relation to me. 
but I can see that they are attractive. And the sort of woman that is attractive to me is increasingly somebody with intellectual capacity. Just physical attributes I, I'm not interested in, really. It's the quality of mind that I find seductive. Did you have a type when you were younger? I don't know. No, not especially. I don't think so. I like I like uh, women with white hair. Always did. Do you mean like grey hair or blondes? Yes, grey, grey or, or or white. Blonde, nah. Blonde's a, a bit a bit sort of samey. <laughs> You're Jewish. Were you raised um, sort of Orthodox Jewish or more progressive Jewish? Well, I was I was brought up in the forties and fifties and sixties, and I'm not sure what the the terms were then. My parents were Orthodox, but not particularly practicing Orthodox. We always belonged to a shul. We always had um, Friday night at home. Um, Mummy sometimes lighted candles, but not always. I always fasted on Yom Kippur, and I still do. However, now I am not burdened by belief. What do you mean by that? I'm an atheist. There are a lot of atheist Jews and some people find this really confusing because uh, Jewish identity can be a cultural thing. It sounds like that's what it's become for you. Yes, it's a very important part of my life. I'm intensely proud and involved and concerned with being Jewish. I have several Jewish magazines and I go to lectures. I'm interested in the politics of Judaism, obviously in the tragedy of Israel and Palestine. And um, a lot of my friends are like me, uh, non, well, not exactly non-observant Jews. I'm a culinary Jew, I suppose. I love the food. I love the jokes. <clears throat> I love our history, not, of course, the Holocaust. That is a, a tragedy. But the fact of my being Jewish informs the whole of my life. It informs my connections with people. It informs my, my love of genealogy, my passionate study of genealogy. And it involves, of course, my political opinions with regard to Israel and Palestine which has made me, and I'm perfectly aware of this, extremely unpopular in Jewish circles. I regret this, but I am right and they are wrong. <laughs> Was there a time when your sexuality coincided or intersected with your Judaism? No. So never. it's never been a problem? Oh, well, it was a problem for my parents, not for me. Um, my parents were distraught, absolutely distraught. How did they find out? I told my mother. It was, again, in when I was in Leicester, I fell in love with the uh, the stage manager. Not the leading woman or anything like that, the stage manager. <laughs> I've always been... Um, a lover of the proletarian. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the alphas. Um, I don't. I don't say that I don't like them because I know a lot of alpha people who are adorable. But it just happens that my whole emotional leaning is towards the underdog, the people who don't have it so good, the people on the rough end of things. And believe me, stage managers are on the rough end of things. Anyway, this this young lady was a, a very nice, a very nice woman. I think she found me 
utterly impossible. Why? I was, it was the first time I'd really been in love with anyone. And I was um, nuts. You know, I just went nuts. Anyway, um, I don't know what's happened to her. I, I'm not in touch with her anymore. But uh, she, she was, <laughs> she really had to deal with a lot of, you know, emotional traumas and fights. And I, it was just silly. I was, I was out of control. I'm, I'm not like that now. Why I'm did not. you feel that you had to tell your parents that you were gay? Because I loved my parents with all my heart, and I still do. That's a portrait of my father behind me. Um, I, I just told my mother everything. I mean, you know, she was my best friend. She was my world. And I, I loved, loved her. And this momentous thing had happened, and I, I felt I had to tell her. And I was wrong. I shouldn't have told her because it, it caused the most, huge pain and it was awful awful and I regret it very much it was selfish of me to have told her because it made me feel that I was being open but it crushed her world because her her whole glory was for me to you know I went to Cambridge I was educated all these things that she had wanted for me and the next step was to be married, to have children. That was the normal, natural wish that she had. And I dashed it forever. It was cruel. But when you say that, the, the alternative would have been to live a lie and what, marry a man to, to fulfil her Well, dream? living a lie, I mean, who gives a fuck, frankly? <laughs> Living a lie, that's not living a lie, not to tell your parents. You, you, you protect them. You don't, you, do, you don't live a lie, you don't pretend that you're, not, that you're not gay to everybody else. But to the people you love the most, protect them. Don't hurt them. Did she make peace with it eventually? No. Never. Nor did my father. So I wounded the two people who, whom I loved most. And that is not something to be proud of. That's so funny that you, that you say that you see it like that. I, I would see it that they wounded you, that they're the ones that were selfish and had something not to be proud of, to not accept you, but you take it on your But spot. how could they in, in 19, when would it be, 1966? How would they have been able to deal with that? Nothing in their lives had prepared them for such a thing. The whole moral and intellectual climate of the day was not receptive to homosexuality. They were just very conventional people. And I don't blame them for that because that was what their upbringing had given them. You know, I've had the chance to break out of all the restraints that they were locked in by. I've become an actress. I found a, a partner. I went to university and that gave me everything. My mother left school at 14 and worked in a dress shop. She wasn't stupid. In fact, she was brilliant. She was a brilliant woman. But her... Her world was a narrow world, mm, and mine is not. Women back then, did Heather ever meet your parents? Oh yes, oh yes. They they didn't know that we had that kind of a relationship. She was a friend, but she came often to Oxford, often. And my mother had a stroke, which was a most tragic thing, the, the most awful thing that's ever happened to me was the thing that happened to my mother. And mm. she was um, paralyzed down one side and became mental and unable to speak. And Heather would come down with me. 
And while I, you know, looked after mummy and did the shopping and washed her and talked to her, mm-hmm. Heather would, would clean the house. She would scrub the floor and scrub the cupboards, empty the fridge. She was wonderful, really wonderful. And it's strange to me that my my parents, my father certainly, never wondered that there was this girl who came and behaved like a like a skivvy. Why would she do that? Well, she did because she loved me, and so she wanted to help. What do you think when you say? I don't know if you've ever been on TikTok. Um, of course, I haven't. I okay. can heavens. What is that? Some media nonsense. Yeah, it's like a social media platform, but there's lesbian TikTok and there are a lot of well, straight Well, don't talk to me about lesbian TikTok. I'm not interested. I can tell you that now. I don't know what it is, but I'm not interested. I was going to tell you that there's a phenomenon of straight women watching lesbian TikTok and deciding that maybe they too would like to experiment in that area. My point is that it is so mainstream now being gay and being queer. Uh, you can get married, uh, all of these things. Does that, how do you feel when you see that? Does it make you happy? Does it make you think, gosh, I had it tougher in my day? Why are you asking all these questions about lesbianism? Are you gay? No, I'm not gay. Why I'm would you be gay. interested? Why would you be interested? I'm not interested. I don't I don't think about that. I mean, I'm in the world. I'm not in a gay world. I'm in the world. That's yeah. the world I want to be in. I don't want to be in a gay world. I mean, I'm happy for anybody who wants to be in a gay world to be in it. Be in the world you want to be in. I want to be in the world. Mm. That's my answer. So you don't like being defined by your sexuality or your religion or anything like that? Well, you can define me in any way that that you like. I don't define me. I'm Miriam Margulies. End of story. I want to ask you about your body. Yeah, that's a a good topic. (laughs) Do I like my body? No, I loathe my body. I'm too fat. I've been too fat all my life. And it's a pity because it it impacts on your health. Um, and I don't, I don't like looking at it. I think it's, it's horrible, but, um, well, there it is. You know, you have to, you have to look at it and realize, Miriam, you're an old fat lady. That's the truth. I watched your show, um, Miriam Margulies' Big Fat Adventure, and it's all about fatness and weight and body image. What you, did, did you think it was point? a uh, was it a good program? Did you was it interesting? It was to me. It was to me. I found um because I I've sort of worked in that area working in women's media all my life. I've worked around body positivity, which you seem to have such a sort of a sneering disregard for, which I quite loved how you were just you thought but the body positivity movement was kind of you, you have a degree of cynicism towards it would you say that's true well i hope i wasn't sneering because i don't think sneering is useful i feel sneering about boris johnson but i think okay no you were not sneering uh, in that same way but you were more skeptical about it yes well it's because it's um, very much outside my own my own experience um I thought they were terrific, those body positive women, actually. You know, these great lumbering females dancing about and having a wonderful time. And what makes you happy is it it can't be bad. It's it's lovely. But it has no relevance to me. You know, I don't feel body positive. I know what I'd like to look like, which is about three three or four stone less. That's that. Then I would feel... You know, that I made my life competent. I'm an incompetent fat lady at the moment. Um, but no, if, if they make if they make themselves feel good and they're moving, you know, that's the key thing, keep moving. 
as good. I liked them. What was your relationship with your body like when you were younger? <laughs> That's such a modern question. Why? I remember, you know, when many, many years ago when I was, I think, at university, um, I remember asking my father what his interior life was like. And he said, my interior life, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and I think I feel a bit the same about, about your question about my relationship with my body. <laughs> I, I didn't have a relationship. With, I mean, I just thought I was fat and I've always been fat. So I'm used to being fat and I just regretted it that I wasn't disciplined enough to do anything about it. And I did a couple of times go to health farms and lost a lot of weight. What I didn't realize when I was young was that I was beautiful. Mm. I had a beautiful face. It was gorgeous. And I didn't know that. And I wished I had. I don't think anybody else shared that opinion, by the way. But when I look at pictures of myself, and I can send you some, you know. Um, I was really beautiful. You looked more Jewish when you were younger. Did I? Yeah, yeah, maybe because my hair was black. Yes. I, I had black I, hair. Because I looked at some younger pictures of you before um, before this interview and I was yeah. surprised to learn you were Jewish, actually. I only learned that you were Jewish, although I should have picked from your name, Miriam, but listening to another interview when you were talking to Louis through. But when I looked back at photos of you younger, I could very much see it. Yes, yes, I think and you're you right. You're very beautiful, but you're still very beautiful. I was thinking that your face is just so beautiful, but I imagine you don't think you are now. Well, I've, I've put on a bit of weight actually on this uh, covid um, lockdown mm. situation. I can see that my my jowls are a bit I'm too fat around there. But I uh, know I like my face. I think it's a good face. Um, it's an intelligent face. It's a kind face. Uh, it's a lively face. Um, it's not too bad. I'm 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 okay with my face. But I wish I'd known that I was beautiful because I would have had more confidence. I didn't have any confidence. When you talk about being fat, you seem very untortured about it. You seem quite matter of fact about it. Is that is that the case or were you tortured? Did you go on diets? Did you try to change your body? Did you, you know? I honestly can't remember. I think I I knew I was fat and I didn't like it. And I hated shopping for clothes, always. I've always hated shopping for clothes. And and those terrifying words when you go into shop, they say, I don't think we've got anything in your size. Those, those words were like stabs in my heart. So I suppose I did I did care. I just didn't care enough to stop eating. You're going to get cross at me because I'm going to ask another lesbian question. But oh, I'm sure there are many. What is the what is the lesbian question? <laughs> is there a lesbian answer? <laughs> I don't know, but I I I always kind of wondered if you because I know that as a straight woman, you you look at your um, body through the lens of the male gaze often, right? Because you want to be sexually attractive to men and there's this idea that a certain body type and a certain size is most attractive to men. So I wanted to ask if you're um, attracted to women and trying, you know, being attract looking for women who you're attractive to, I imagined in my naivety that you would be free of that sort of patriarchal male gaze and ideas about what was fat and what was not fat. Is that not the case? I never, ever thought in my life about being attractive to to, to gay women, to, to other lesbians. That never crossed my mind. Why? I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what lesbians like. 
<laughs> because they're all different. I don't know what would be attractive to a to a lesbian. I have no idea. But that's kind of what I mean. So I thought that I don't know. I imagine that lesbians are just more more highly evolved. Than, but than... darling, they're all different. You can't lump a whole lot of lesbians into one big bag. They're just all different, just like straight people are all different. Mm. You just can't do it. I'm sorry. I you imagine know, we're all women different. Are more forgiving of other women's bodies, I guess I wanted to say. Well, no, some are and some aren't. I just don't think that there is a there's no lesbian a, un, a unifying image. principle about lesbianism. They're just different. It's like saying, do you think people with brown hair always like tomatoes? Mm. I think you've some do well on these. and some don't. <laughs> How did the menopause go for you? I didn't have one, so it right. went very well because when I was 36, my womb was removed. Um, my ovaries remained, but my womb was removed because I had fibroid, uh, uh, fibroid benign tumours in my womb, and it was considered the safest thing was to remove them. As I knew that I never wanted children, and I always knew that I didn't, it was not a trauma. So I had no womb and no menopause wow. and no children. And some people say, oh, when you get older, you'll look back with regret as to not having children because you've got no one to look after you and no one to help you do your online shopping and show you how to use TikTok. <laughs> Is that true? I wish that I had um, – no, actually, I don't th I don't uh, wish I'd had children in any way at all because I've got people. My next-door neighbour comes and does computer for me. Mm. Um, I've got plenty of friends who go shopping and do things, and I think it's jolly mean to expect children to, to be carers as well. I mean, I was a carer for both my parents because there was nobody else, and I'm very glad I was available. But um, I have never wanted children, and I, I'm happy for other people to have them. In fact, I delight in other people's children, but they can go home after tea. <laughs> was Heather always on the same page with that? Yes. Yes, she was. And tell me, you've moved sort of from acting to doing documentaries now. Do you enjoy doing documentaries? I mean, I hope you. May do, I ask you what makes you what makes you think I've moved from acting to documentaries? Can I can I otherwise suggest that I have added documentaries to my CV? Yes. You have. You've broadened your CV and you now also make documentaries. Well, that's what I'm hoping. That's the plan. Do you love working? Yes. Or do you need to work? I do need to work because if, uh, God forbid, I have a stroke like my mother did and I needed 24-hour care, I don't have enough money to pay for that for longer than a certain number of years. Mm. So I do mm. need to work. Um, I've never had um, a million pounds in cash, for example, in my bank account. Never. I own properties so that if I liquidated everything, I would have a million pounds in cash or more probably. But at the moment, I'm looking at cash and I don't have enough cash to sustain me through a 10 year stroke. So I do need to work. What's well, funny you say that about a million dollars because when you Google your name under the section, people also ask, what is Miriam Margulies worth? Do you want me to tell you how much you're worth? Oh yeah. <laughs> $6 million. Well, that would be, um, if I sold everything I own, I would, I hope, have $6 million. But I would have to sell this house, a house in Australia, the house in Italy, house by the sea, 
and my flat next door. And if I liquidized, is that the word? Liquidated. I think liquidized. <laughs> liquidized is what you do to watermelon. Um, <laughs> if I liquidated all my my pro, uh, portfolio, mm. I would be worth a million, uh, six million dollars. But you don't want to do that. No, of course I don't. No, I don't. Do you want to know the other questions that people also want to know about you on Google? Yes. <laughs> Who is Miriam Margulies' partner? We've covered Right. Up. What is Miriam Margulies worth? What age is Miriam Margulies? Well, that's easy. They can look that up any time. I, I, I'll be 80 on May the 18th next year. Why did Miriam Margulies become an Australian citizen? Good We've question. Yeah, I, I I became an Australian citizen because Heather's Australian and uh, we built a house together with her sister in Australia and I wanted to be able to come and go as an Australian. What's your impression of the different Australian cities? You've travelled around Australia quite a lot. You've made a documentary. Yes, uh, I learned a lot in the last series that I did. Uh, it was called Miriam Margulies Almost Australian. And it's just gone out in England, which um, I was rather interested in the reaction, which was good. I was I was pleased that it was good. But I, I learned a lot, particularly about the First Nation. And um, it it's a complicated country. And it's it's not going in the direction that I want. Because I am, I think, um, I don't want to say anti-American, but I am highly critical of many of the uh, American trends. And I think that Australia is moving towards America mm. in, in the things they're thinking and doing. And most particularly in the programs that you see on Australian television. I want more Australian content. I want to see more Australian artists and actors because you have the most amazing talents in Australia. It, it, it's, it's a gifted nation and they're not being given a fair suck of the sauce bottle. That's my feeling. So, well, I forgot what the question was now. But anyway, that's Your impressions <laughs> of the different cities. Because you see, yes, you're my impressions like Sydney, Sydney, but you don't so much anymore. I don't like Sydney so much now because it's got very dirty and busy. To to you know, I I just remember trying to cross over the bridge, um, from the eastern suburbs to the North Shore, because they're the great pockets of Jews, <laughs> and I've got <laughs> relatives on both sides, and they're wonderful relatives. And my relative Anne Sarzin, um, who actually is now on the east. But she was on the north and she invited me to a wonderful cook. And I was desperate to have the fish that she had fried for me. I couldn't get across. Couldn't. The bridge was blocked. And I waited in, the, in a queue for two and a half hours. And then, uh, and then I went home. And after that, I didn't like Sydney. <laughs> but I do love Adelaide, I think, almost more than any other city. I think it's just beautiful. Beautiful city. And I've had wonderful times there. I, I think South Australia is, is exceptional. Goolwa is my particular delight. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I love, I love Western Australia, but I didn't get to Western Australia and South Australia or Tasmania in the series I did, so I'm hoping to do another series if I'm allowed to. Um, but I think Melbourne is a... Fabulous place. Absolutely fabulous. Um, I really love it. There's a, whole, there's a whole genre on YouTube of you on talk shows and uh, on Graham Norton and mm. on the Today Show and on the uh, Good Morning Britain or whatever it is. You seem to really enjoy that, going on those shows. Is there like a, a shtick that you have to – be part of, that you know what you've got to bring? 
Well, when I first went on Graham Norton, and I love him, by the way, he's a terrific person. He makes it lovely for everybody. Um, I was really scared because I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to say, and I and I still don't know what I'm going to say. Um, but it was a very happy experience. I enjoyed it, and um, I seem to be able to tell stories in a way that people enjoy them and, and laugh and mm. and uh, that's lovely. I mean, I feel I, I'm delighted when I hear laugh. Quite laughing. flirty too. That's my natural, that's my way, you know. That's always been my way. It's Flir- funny a flirty, I mean, promise without uh, without completion. <laughs> You're an equal opportunity flirt. You sort of seem yes. to just cast your light across anybody in your path. And yeah, charm. because it's people. Mm. It's people that are utterly thrilling and desirable. People. Sex is immaterial. People. It wasn't a lesbian question. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, it's interesting that it wasn't a lesbian question and it's not a lesbian answer. It's about the universality of the delight of talking to people. Um, I'm beginning to feel that I have done it enough. So now, I mean, yours is probably the last podcast that I'll do oh. until I maybe do my own series of podcasts, you know. Which you should. And, and do what you're doing, um, ask the questions. Because uh, there's only so much of yourself that's that you can give. Otherwise, there's nothing left, you know. And um, I know that people expect me to be – the word that's usually used is outrageous. Um, and I don't want to be pressured into being outrageous. I don't want to I don't want to be pressured into anything, but I just want to tell the truth and answer the questions as spontaneously and truthfully as I can, which you have to agree that I do. Do you I do. not? I do agree. Yes, because like your your podcast interview with Louis Theroux was quite something. <laughs> I haven't heard it. Yes. I, d- I don't listen to my uh, Well, it to involved my stuff. an anecdote about a soldier being up a tree and um, pleasuring himself. Do you remember that story? I won't ask you to tell it again. I do, I do remember it. I, I remember the occasion. And I remember that I, that I thought that Louis was asking far too many sex questions. Um, yeah. And that surprised me because I... I didn't expect it. You know, I'm a, I'm a little old lady. Uh, sex is a memory. And I don't, um, he was jogging that particular memory <laughs> rather more than I thought was appropriate. And I told him so too. I wanted to just finish by asking you about um, nothing to do with sex, but about women. I don't know if you're familiar with the trope of Karen women um, being mocked for complaining about things. There's this, uh, it's quite a complicated trope, but this idea of Karen being this mocking name for women who want to speak to the manager or who complain about things or who are Oh, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I didn't know about this uh, trope, as you call it. I've never heard of it. it, it, Is it an Australian thing? No, it's sort of global and it's it's complicated because it has different meanings in different cultures. So in America, it's got – in some places it's got quite racist overtones. Like, you know, that woman who was in Central Park and called the police on the black man and tried to say, there's a man attacking me. I don't know if you saw that video. But so there's – you know, in, in some ways it can be used to, to describe women who misuse their authority to get uh, people in trouble. But the idea of – women not being able to say, I don't like this, this isn't good enough. Like the exactly the email that you sent to me this morning and to our team saying, stop asking me to download this software. This is all too hard. I can't do this crap. Stop making me. And I just thought, go, you good thing. And I wanted to ask about, is that an, something that comes with age? And you say you've always done it, but it's like, we're conditioned as women to want to be polite and seek approval and have everyone like us. And you seem to not be burdened by that. 
no, I'm not. I don't think I am. I I want people to like me. Um, of course, I'd be nuts if I if I didn't. But I'm not going to pretend to be another kind of person in order for them to do that. Um, it, it, that that's not how I react to things. I, I want. I, I'm interested in the truth more than anything else. I want people to see the truth. That's why I am anti-Zionist, because I want to see, I see and I want others to see the horrors that Zionism has brought to a whole nation. That's why I see it as truth. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the only thing that I'm really interested in, in telling the truth, not in a way that antagonizes or brutalizes or offends even or hurt. I don't want to offend people. Um, but sometimes the the specific word is, is useful. Uh, I won't say them now. I've said it once, haven't I? I don't want to say it again. Um, uh, people are terribly upset when they hear that. Well, What word? The, the F word and the C word. Oh, I, you haven't said those words. And people get very, very upset. Well, sometimes it's good for them to be upset. But on the whole, I, I truly, I want to make people happy. Truly, I do. Mm. And that's what I'm about. I want to make money, live, live happily, live healthily, and do the right thing. Mummy always said, do the right thing thing that was one of her mantras in my life do the right thing and we all know what the right thing is we have a choice and we know what the right thing is and that's what I've always tried to do but I think that I probably um, have been elevated for some reason that I can't quite understand into being you know, this personality that, you know, you get her on a show and she's funny and she'll be outrageous and and uh, that sort of thing. Well, it's very flattering and I'm, of course, pleased, you know, but people have called me a national treasure in England. And the other day, somebody called me in a newspaper review, a national trinket. And I thought that was very much writer. Why do you that, like that, a national trinket? Because I'm not a national treasure. I, I, I'm not important enough. I haven't done enough to merit such a thing. Vera Lynn was a national treasure. She was a great person who increased the sum of happiness for millions of people. I am not in that category. But I've done my bit. So if you... Scale it down. I'm a national trinket. One more question. What's the best part about getting older? People think you're wiser. Not you necessarily wiser. true. <laughs> Say that again. You are wiser. You have to be just by virtue of number of years on earth. I hope so. I hope that I have learned on my journey. Um, that's that's the that's the goal. That's the aim to end up wiser. Um, but my lesson for people is be kind, be kinder. Mm. That there will always be the best thing. If you can't be wise, be kind. And if you be, if you can be wise and kind, that's tops. Miriam Margulies, I think you are a national treasure, a, a trink, a treasure trinket. <laughs> if you could trinket, be a national, trinket. you could be a national tzatzka. <laughs> yes, a national tzatzki. Yes. yes, that's what. What you a are. wonderful thing! I I'm going to use that. Thank I you very you much. National now, I've got a last question for you. Am I as you thought? Have I in any way surprised you? No. No. 
I think I, I totally get what you're saying about how, and I suspected this, that people can want you to perform, like come on, perform, be outrageous. And I could really sense that that could then, it's addictive, but it can also become a pressure. Every, everybody I've ever asked, have I surprised you? They always say no. <laughs> so what is are, a girl are you disappointed? to do? I feel like you're disappointed. Of course I'm disappointed. I'm, I think I should be surprising. It means that there's nothing left to know about me. You know everything. I, I am an open and somewhat dog-eared book. <laughs> I thought you'd want to talk about sex. I don't know why I thought that. I don't want to talk about Look, sex is for doing, not for talking about. Mm. But you don't want to do it either. <laughs> no, I don't. I love you. I'm going to end the interview on the same note that we started on saying, I love you. Thank you for being so generous. Neither of us have needed a wee break. No, things are looking up. It's a bloody miracle. (laughs) Thank you so much. Take so much care.